From the very late 1600s, a new type of arm began its ascendancy, becoming for nearly 150 years the primary arm of all Western armies. The flintlock smoothbore musket. Of course, in British and Empire service, this was known colloquially as Brown Bess. Various patterns existed throughout its considerable service life, officially named the Land Pattern Musket, to differentiate it from the various sea service patterns. By the 1830s, newer technologies were gaining a foothold in the often reactionary and tradition-bound military. While not perhaps revolutionary, the invention and subsequent acceptance of the percussion lock heralded a new age. Entering service in the 1840s, the percussion smoothbore musket would finally replace the venerable flintlock around the empire. In this episode of the Firepower series, we'll compare and contrast these two dissimilar yet somewhat similar arms through a simple course of fire and the usual discussion. For the bulk of the 1600s, the matchlock musket had been the predominant firearm of European armies. What was initially a large, heavy, unwieldy weapon became, as the century waned, a more streamlined version. This was gradually supplemented, then usurped, by the first of the flint-fired muskets. These early versions held the name doglock, derived from the dog, or catch, used to hold the cock at an intermediate position for loading or other preparatory activities. The so-called half-cock position was incorporated into the internals of the lock assembly, and the true flintlock was born. The weapon went through a number of iterations, but remained fundamentally unchanged, save for adjustments in length and modification of minor furniture and the like. This is the weapon that would arm the British Army and the armies of the Empire for nearly 150 years. From the Battle of Blenheim and the other battles of the War of Spanish Succession, through the middle of the century and the War of Austrian Succession and the Seven Years' War. It was used during the American Revolution and on into the wars of the French Revolution. Subsequent to this, the Napoleonic conflicts held sway, and it is perhaps these that we are more familiar with. The flintlock Brown Bess was used up to the very early 1840s, when the newly developed percussion lock entered service. These would see service in ever-increasing numbers as the 1840s progressed. In China during the First Opium War, South Africa in the Cape Frontier Wars, the Punjab during the Sikh Wars, and elsewhere. The driving force behind the adoption of the percussion system was one George Lovell. Percussion systems had been invented and patterned from the early 1800s when Alexander Forsyth began experiments with exploding fulminates and their application to firearms. It was a slow burn for sure. Pardon the pun. Serious trials began only in the 1820s after being shelved for a number of reasons, including the perception that it wasn't even needed. George Lovell took up the mantle of progress in the mid-1830s, and very shortly after that, a number of patterns of percussion smoothbore arms began to enter service. These would become the standard arms of the entire empire. The first percussion lock weapon to be adopted in the British Army was in fact the Brunswick Rifle of 1837. With its back action lock and two groove barrel, this weapon would replace the famous flintlock Baker Rifle of Peninsular Warfame. By the mid-1840s, the percussion musket would be ubiquitous around the Empire, bringing to a close nearly 150 years of flintlock service arms. In India, too, the evolution of military arms was followed. Apart from the British troops stationed in the subcontinent, the vast majority of military strength lay in the armies of the three Indian presidencies, Bombay, Madras, and Bengal. These were all separate entities administratively, though of course fell under the central governing body of British India, the Honourable East India Company. The armies of John Company, as it was known, actually had been the inspiration in the late 1700s for the adoption of a simpler type of musket by the British Army. The company arm was copied 
and entered service as the India Pattern Musket. This weapon would become the standard infantry arm from the Napoleonic Wars through to its replacement by percussion arms in the 1840s. Existing in a parallel system, the Honorable East India Company adopted percussion arms from 1840. There were a number of patterns discussed later, and it would be these weapons that would see extensive use during the Indian Mutiny of 1857. The weapons of the East India Company differed only cosmetically from those of the Ordnance Pattern, or those used by the British Army. Similar dimensions, weight, caliber, and furniture were all hallmarks of East India Company arms. Although an exhaustive study of all of these arms is not the preserve of this video, perhaps a general orientation to the arms of empire as they were from Waterloo through to the 1850s. Adopted in 1797 as the primary service arm in the British Army, the India pattern musket would feature more basic details than those found on the preceding short land pattern. It maintained its traditional handrail style butt, had a shorter 39 inch barrel, and its furniture was overall much more simple. Patterned in the early 1800s, the new land pattern was intended to return the army to a more traditional and higher quality arm. This musket was never issued widely and remained generally issued only to the guards battalions in the late Napoleonic era. It featured a simplified and flat lock plate, a new style of butt devoid of its handrail, and a return to the 42-inch barrel. Developed and issued in the midst of the Napoleonic Wars, the new land pattern light infantry musket retained the 39-inch barrel of the India pattern, though with the addition of a simple backsight. The butt was of the Newland pattern style, and there was the addition of a scroll-type trigger guard. If we can discount George Lovell's back-actioned 1838 pattern musket that was only issued to the guards, the first widely issued percussion musket was the pattern 1839. This featured various older musket parts repurposed and mounted in a new stock. The Newland style butt became omnipresent, and the P-39 featured Newland light infantry pattern barrels, including the aforementioned backsight. The lock plate was a repurposed Newland pattern, and the barrel was secured to the stock with keys instead of the pins used previously. Importantly, action was taken to alleviate the tendency of the bayonet to move back and forth on, or even fall off of the barrel. Initially, the P-39 featured what was known as the Hanoverian-style bayonet catch, which was a spring clip that held the bayonet somewhat securely to the barrel. It's important to note that these muskets were not conversions per se of earlier flintlock arms, but rather simply used various parts, some heavily modified, to realize what was a perfectly serviceable percussion musket. A fire in the Tower of London Armoury in 1841 saw a modest number of these 1839 muskets, a smaller number of the 1838 muskets, and a considerable number of older flintlock and ancillary arms, such as sergeants' fusils and the like, lost, rather than the popular conception of this event causing the design and manufacture of a new type of musket due to the losses incurred, the next pattern of arm would actually be patterned and sealed three days before the fire. That said, this new pattern arm, the 1842 percussion musket, would be a wholly new manufactured weapon. Outwardly very similar to the 1839 pattern, it did feature a new simplified lock without the large forward extension of the lock plate that had once been used to accommodate the pan, hammer, and spring of the flintlock. A new and improved bayonet catch was introduced, the Lovell pattern, which held the bayonet much more securely than the Hanoverian pattern used earlier. As mentioned earlier, the armies of the Honorable East India Company also adopted percussion arms from the early 1840s. Their weapons were manufactured by the trade, mostly in London, though with some aspects done in that of Birmingham. The company's arms were of high quality, and following a similar route to that taken by the Board of Ordnance for British muskets, the first percussion muskets used repurposed parts made originally for flintlock arms. There would be six patterns in total of East India Company percussion muskets, A through F. 
These would not differ at all from corresponding ordnance weapons as far as capability and usage went. What differences there were were those of quality and cosmetics. Shown here for reasons that will become obvious, the last pattern of East India Company percussion musket, the F pattern, featured a P-42 style lock, a Brunswick style trigger guard, a fixed back sight, barrel keys, and a third style of bayonet catch, one that had been trialed on ordnance muskets, but not adopted. One point that bears mention is that all of these weapons held a nominal caliber of 11 bore. That equates roughly to 0.76 of an inch. The ammunition used, as we'll discuss later, was a 69 caliber ball wrapped in a paper cartridge. The first use of percussion weapons in battle by the British Army was at the Battle of Amoy in 1841 during the First Opium War in China. In an interesting twist, the 55th foot went into action carrying not Ordnance Pattern 1839 arms, but rather East India Company A-Pattern muskets, which had been issued at Calcutta the year before. This would not be an isolated incident of East India Company arms being issued directly to the British Army. Many other examples exist of company weapons being issued to British regiments either as direct replacement of old flintlock arms or as replacements for worn-out ordnance pattern percussion arms. Nor should this be taken to represent the fact that the whole army was re-equipped by this time. There were still regiments that were turning in their flintlocks for percussion arms well into the mid-1840s. So to answer the question that some of you may be asking, why go through all this explanation of different types of weapons when all that is needed is a flintlock and a percussion lock? Well, I have but two such examples, and I thought that some background might be appreciated to illustrate that the two types of muskets used in the project do indeed fit the bill, as it were, though they may not necessarily have been strictly in service together. The two muskets used for this project are the channel's second pattern of India pattern brown bess and the Honourable East India Company F pattern percussion musket. These are exemplary of the two generations of arms that saw the transition from flint to percussion ignition in the early 1840s. The India pattern bess is in fact a trade gun bought by the government of New Brunswick to arm the militia just after Waterloo, near about 1820. The lock features the usual aspects of a later India pattern, including the ring neck cock. The F pattern musket is a pedestrian example, featuring on the lock plate the rampant lion used in later patterns of East India Company arms. The ramrods in both cases are iron held with the usual brass pipes. As noted earlier, the F pattern has the East India Company pattern bayonet catch, and the shaft of the ramrod is characteristically squared off behind the head. This is in stark contrast to that of the India pattern, in that the only piece holding the bayonet on the muzzle is the bayonet lug. Of course, the India pattern musket does not feature a back sight. And, while one exists on the F pattern, it's a very simple, fixed version. The front sight of the F pattern has a somewhat peculiar pyramid shape. The ammunition used in these practices follows closely historical examples, such as this one, found in the National Army Museum's collection. The aforementioned 69 caliber ball, in this case cast from a simple Lee mold, is worked into a cartridge including 120 grains of 2F powder held together with a piece of string. As was the drill historically, both these weapons used the cartridge loaded with the paper attached to the ball. After ripping the back of the cartridge off, exposing the powder, the powder is then poured down the barrel and the existing paper-wrapped ball is then pushed into the muzzle, paper first. When this is fully rammed home on top of the powder, it creates a very simple wad, or savet. This helps stabilize the ball in the barrel and acts as a somewhat rudimentary gas check, though, as you might imagine, the small ball in the large barrel leaves much to be desired as far as the escape of gas. The target used for the practices is the number two figure of great war usage. Though not perhaps historical to the arms, I've tried to use it for all of the firepower series, thereby creating a useful tool in the greater comparison. It was set in this case at 50 yards. The practice chosen was quite simple, four rounds on the clock at 50 yards from the standing position. 
I suppose there will always be the debate when the rate of fire testing arises. Does the first load actually count? Well, there are arguments for and against, which admittedly are all a bit moot and pointless anyway, when taken in the context of being in action. But I, I digress. Here, I chose not to count the first load, as would be the case in any battlefield engagement, the firelocks being loaded before going into action. The clock would start at the first shot. I suppose this would be a good time to discuss a bit of an elephant in the room. And that's regarding the question of rapid fire in the age of muzzle-loading service arms. While the popular conception of British musketry of the era is full of three rounds a minute in any weather, and the eye-rolling, bite, pour, spit, tap of a certain popular television series, the reality of rapid shooting proves to be much more muted. The fact remains that in practice, British musketry did not manifest itself in all-out rapid shooting, but conversely, in singular, specific, well-timed, and well-directed volleys, followed up by an immediate attack with the bayonet. If one volley was not enough, then sometimes two, but rarely more, were delivered before the bayonets leveled and the enemy set upon. That said, rapid shooting is a somewhat useful tool to use in comparing different generations of arms. The best practice carried on with reasonable pace. In retrospect, it may appear that things are not proceeding with the utmost of haste. One point to consider is that the target needed to be aimed at, which of course takes time. This skill was taught in the era, and men were instructed to look along the barrel from breech nail to front sight with the left eye closed. Obviously, when firing volleys, the trigger would be pulled on command, whilst when performing file firing, or when in extended order, there would have been more capacity to take more care and time. Speaking of time, this practice took 1 minute and 22 seconds. Admittedly, not perhaps the ultimate effort, but as I reviewed the footage, there wasn't too much time in the way of pregnant delays or pauses. Well, there we are, four rounds, as rapidly as possible. We'll still try to hit the target, of course. One miss here on the left, and three here on the target. Learning how to achieve some semblance of aiming is a bit of a dark art with the best. Judging how much barrel you should see as you look along it comes with repetition, more of which I evidently could use. Next, it was the turn of the F pattern. Now, going into this, I can say that there wasn't any great expectation as far as timing went. The priming of a flintlock and the capping of a percussion lock are distinctive parts of either evolution. And although they are done at different points in the evolution, one is not vastly superior to the other. What I was expecting was a better group. Even though the sights are rudimentary, they are, well, sights, and the benefit to overall performance should go without saying. In the 1840s, infantry were still equipped with the traditional cross belts for ammunition pouch and bayonet. Caps were kept in a small pouch let into the lower right front of the coatee. Later on, into the 1850s, a waist belt was adopted for the bayonet, and some units chose to adopt a cap pouch mounted at the front right of the belt, rather than the one let into the garment. As I didn't have a wholly appropriate garment, I simply placed a supply of caps in the pocket of my bush jacket. Somewhat clumsier, but serviceable enough. The practice went along with the same steady progress as with the best. I must admit that attempting to be proficient at so many different loading drills can play havoc with one's muscle memory. With my mind firmly in the percussion mode, I kept fighting the urge to draw a cap from the pouch at the front of the pouch belt, as I am accustomed to with the Enfield. Historically, the loading drill did change to reflect the new technology. Whereas in the flintlock era, priming was done first from the cartridge, in the percussion era, capping was done as shown here, after loading. Time for the practice, 1 minute and 19 seconds. 
To date, my only other attempt at shooting something resembling a good college try with the F pattern was at last year's Alberta shoot. There, best 10 of 13, standing at 50 meters. While that shoot wasn't timed, I suppose it was a useful benchmark in going into this practice. Well, it would appear as though I've been able to demonstrate crappy smoothbore shooting, not once, but twice in a row. Well, one, two, three hits, and the wind doesn't blow us over here. Four, off to the left there. I was expecting slightly better results there because, well, quite frankly, the F pattern uh, has a set of sights. Remarkably, the group had an uncanny resemblance to that of the Bess. As has become customary with the Firepower series, perhaps a bit of analysis and discussion. In the end, the results from both arms were nearly identical. Each three hits, and but three seconds between them. So, was this what was to be expected? If so, then how would that place these two generations of arms in the historical context? If there was such little difference between these two types, then why did they transition to the percussion lock in the first place? Firstly, as regards timed or rapid fire, this simply was not an expectation doctrinally with either arm. While one could expect that generally well-drilled infantry would be faster in the reload, rapid shooting within a given time limit did not become a bona fide evolution until 1887, when the first rapid practice was introduced, featuring 10 rounds in a minute with the martini. So, while my times might have a degree of modesty to them, perhaps they reflect a relative parity with the historical. As for the apparent overall similarity between the two arms, perhaps the context should be a brief, a very brief examination of the type of warfare that was waged during these eras. Thankfully for you, the viewer, you'll be spared some sort of onerous dissertation and dance of minutia, because although we might expect tactics, drills, and the operational art to change with the advent of new technology, when we look at the battles of, say, the peninsula of the 1810s, the Sikh Wars of the 1840s, and even the Crimean War of the 1850s, there was very, very little change in fighting methods. The simple fact remains, and it could be backed up by the result of these very rudimentary practices, that the battlefield capabilities of the smoothbore musket, whether flintlock or percussion, were essentially the same. Rate of fire, accuracy, weight, and the use of the bayonet. That is why infantry warfare changed very little during this era. So, why make the switch? That is more easily understood in the context of two things, weather and reliability. While the primed pan of a flintlock was a complete liability in poor weather, the waterproof copper percussion cap set firmly on the nipple was much, much less so. It was not perfect, as indeed the first early morning encounters at the Battle of Inkerman in November of 1854 would show, but, as compared to its predecessor, a great leap forward. Misfire rates in general became greatly reduced, and it was this aspect that was manifestly the chief benefit of percussion arms. For those wishing for more information on the weapons of the 1830s and 40s, may I direct you to a book, new at the time of the publishing of this video, entitled British Ordnance Muskets of the 1830s and 40s by Adrian Rhodes. A stalwart member of the British Military Forum and a friend of the channel, Adrian has penned a fantastic book full of wonderful pictures, technical data and history of British percussion smoothbore arms and the driving force behind their adoption, George Lovell. It's available at the Royal Armouries website, link below. And for those interested in the incredible and detailed story of East India Company small arms, the authority lies in the works of David Harding. His introductory volume, an exhaustive four-tome set examining in incredible detail every single solitary aspect of company arms, from patterns to users 
to ammunition and training is unsurpassed. Sadly, they are all out of print, and copies available are incredibly expensive. Have a Google if you fancy yourself a heart attack. After you've recovered from that, have a look at Colonel Mike Snook's two-volume set about the Cape Frontier Wars. Extremely well illustrated, they cover the little-known operations and actions in South Africa from the 1830s through the 1850s. Of course, these campaigns overlap this period of transition from flint to percussion. Link in the description. If you'd like to support the channel, please stop by our Patreon page. The link is in the description below. For more information on projects and updates between videos, follow us on our Facebook page. What was once Utreon is now Player. It still remains a good alternative to YouTube and Patreon, as those platforms have become rather troublesome for content has found on this channel. May I suggest following British muzzleloaders there as well.